Well, good morning. How's everyone today? It's good to see you guys this morning. Uh, as Ryan has maybe mentioned once or 12 times, we do have our annual meeting tonight. And so today's message is kind of geared a little bit towards that because this week, this weekend, we're thinking about the church. And you know, we're in the midst of this series called Risky Business When Comfort and Faith Collide. And you know, I, I realize that, uh, that risk is something that most of us aren't really thrilled with most of the time. I mean, anybody ever opened an investment account before, a stock account or anything? Every time you do that, they give you one of those little surveys, right? What's that survey all about? They want to know how much risk can you stand in your portfolio. So if you have stocks or bonds or whatever, they want to know how quickly are you going to panic and run if something bad happens. In fact, as I was thinking about this week, I pulled up one of those surveys, and here's an actual question from one of those surveys. It says this, from September 2008 through November 2008, stocks lost more than 31%. If I owned a stock investment that lost about 31% in three months, I would A, sell all of the remaining investment, B, sell a portion of the remaining investment, uh, C, hold on to the investment and sell nothing, or D, buy more of the investment. All right, so let's just take a quick poll. How many of you would say A, just sell it, I can't take it, it's killing my heart? Nobody? All right, good, good investors here. How many of you would say D, I'm gonna buy as much of that as I can? All right, look at those risky people right there. Ooh, all right. The rest of you kind of fall in the middle where you're not that risk, I mean, you're kind of risk averse. You want, you know, you want, you want, you want the return, but without the risk. You know, this question, like others, gives us that insight. How much risk can we really tolerate. And if you're like most people, our tolerance level typically isn't very high. Now, some of you, it seems like maybe you're a little higher than you should be. You'll be climbing Everest or parachuting out of a plane or something, right? But for others, our risk tolerance just isn't very high. Yes, we want that 30% return on investment, but with zero risk involved. And if you find that investment, please let me know. I've got some money I'd like to put in there. But we know it just doesn't exist. Why? Because as, Tom, as it's attributed to Thomas Jefferson as saying, with great risk comes great reward. And if we want great reward, oftentimes it means we're going to have to be willing to, to risk greatly. If we want to experience the great things, if we want life to be more than just that right race every day, then we know that risk is required. But we also know that sometimes being comfortable is very hard to break out of. It's not called a comfort zone for no reason. In fact, I think that the South has perfected what we like to call comfort food, you know, the stuff that just makes us feel really good, right? Um, we would all look at people that take unnecessary risks and we call them crazy. We think, why, why are you doing that? But isn't it a, a little bit crazy for us to think that we can exist in this world without any risk at all? And what happens when we're following God, when we're living our life and we're faced with a decision, and one, decent, one option for us looks very extremely risky and the other appears safer, but what happens if in that moment what appears to be safe is actually the riskier of the two choices? Sometimes we don't always see that, but what happens when we're faced with that? Make no mistake, following God, it's risky. But, it's, but is it possible that sometimes it's riskier to not take a risk? This could apply to several areas of our lives. As I was thinking about some risks that I have taken in my own life, I thought back to college, thought back to uh, my sophomore year specifically. Freshman year, I had dated a few nice women and just never found a good connection with any of them. It was fine. I've never enjoyed the dating game. It was always very painful for me. I've shown you pictures of what I looked like back then. You can understand why it may have been a little painful. But I can remember the beginning of my sophomore year. I was, I'd gone out with this one young lady. She was very nice, beautiful young lady, great personality, but there was just no connection. I mean, it was just... Yeah, it wasn't going to happen. And I remember coming back to my dorm that night, and I just thought to myself, all right, and get this, I'm a fresh, or excuse me, a sophomore, so I'm, what, 19 years old, 20. And I thought to myself, I'm already done with this dating game. I am sick of this. So what can we do about this? And I started thinking about others that were in my sphere, 
And I thought of this one young lady, and I thought, you know, we're friends. We get along well. We make each other laugh. We have a good time when we're together. She's got a great personality. We compliment each other well. You know what? When I think about the people that I want to really date, she's at the top of the list. So I mustered all the courage that I could. I picked up my landline phone, (laughs) because that's how old I am, and I dialed that number. I don't think I had to do this. (laughs) I think I'm a little younger than that. But I picked up the phone, called this young woman, and I said, hey, would you meet with me? I, I want to talk to you about something. And fortunately, she said yes. And this sounds like a 1950s moment here. We went to the front of the gym and sat on the steps in front of the gym with the it was night and the street lights were on and all this. And we chit-chat. And finally, I, I get there, and I'm like, okay, I'm just going to spit it out. And I'm scared to death. I mean, I'm just like heart racing, you know, because I don't know what she's going to say. And I say, look, when I think of all the women that, that, that are around me, and I think about who compliments me, who, who I have a great time with, who I think we're a good match and a good fit for, you always come to the top of the list. we never really given this a shot. What do you think? And of course, she looked at me and she said, no, no, I'm just kidding. She said, yes. She said, you know what? You're right. I, I, I like you. We're good friends. Let's see what happens. And then this past May, we celebrated our 24th wedding anniversary. You know, exactly. Absolutely. But I think back to that moment, what, in t- what went before that moment of actually taking that risk and being willing to overcome the things, the obstacles in my way to be willing to say, what do you think? Could we get, would, could, can we take a shot at this? Because there were a lot of things that happened. And then I think about my life since then. Now, I don't think Carrie has been the savior of my life. That's Jesus. I know that. But I do think about my life and even landing in Iowa, I mean, you got to admit, the woman's a little nuts to have her husband come home and say, hey, I'd like to quit my really nice banking job and move to Iowa to be a pastor. Woman's a little crazy on that, but she was always supportive. I mean, I don't know if I've ever told you this, but Carrie, in that process of me coming to Ashworth 12 years ago, uh, 12 years ago tomorrow, by the way, um, she always had veto power. I told her that from the beginning. I said, if any moment in this process you think, I can't do this, I can't be this far away from my family, all you have to do is say no, and we're walking away. And she never said no. She's been there. The reason we have 800 children is because my wife had a, had a desire and a passion to be a foster parent. And I'm going to tell you, I didn't want to do it, and God changed my heart, but I wouldn't change anything now except the sleepless night we had last night with a two-year-old in our bed, but that's another story. All this is because a young, very skinny, very geeky looking 19-year-old kid mustered up the courage to make a phone call and say, what do you think? You see, as I look at that risk that I took, I think I'm really glad I took it. I don't think my life would have been in the gutter somewhere, but I don't think it would have been where it is had I not taken that risk. And that's where I want us to get to today is when we look at and we consider the risks that we are called to take when it's riskier to stay put, when it's riskier to just sit in that comfort zone, playing it safe. If you were here last week, you know we we looked at Moses, and we talked about how it's risky to say yes to God's call, and he had this incredible experience, burning bush and all that. We're going to be continuing kind of with this story this week. We're going to fast forward, though, Because after Moses said yes to the call, he goes to Pharaoh a few times and says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, no. And then he says, yes, haha, just kidding, no. And then the 10 plagues come, and this is horrible. And finally, though, it it breaks Pharaoh, and he's able to say, yes, get out of here, go. And Moses gathers up the Israelites, and they begin to march, and they go, and they get to the Red Sea, and the Red Sea parts miraculously, and they walk across, and then we find that they go to uh, Mount Sinai, and uh, they set there for, they, they set up camp, and they're there for a year. And while they're there at the base of this mountain, Moses is getting the commandments from God. He's also getting all these other rules and regulations and instructions for building the tabernacle and all this stuff. But then after a year, what happens is um, they get the instruction and God says it's time to go. And so they pick up and they begin the journey and they move forward to claim the promised land, the land that God had given them. And they come to a place called Kadesh or Kadesh Barnea. 
And this was kind of the gateway to the promised land. And if you want to read the full story, you can pick it up around Numbers 13. We're going to read part of it today. But in this moment where they come to Kadesh, they are there, they're setting up, and they're looking forward. And Moses picks 12 guys, and he says, I want you guys to go scope out the land. Go look at it, see what it looks like, and then come back and give us a report. And that's where I want us to look at right now is what happened after these 12 guys go into the land, and then they come back, and they make their report to Moses. So this is Numbers chapter 13. We're going to start reading in verse 26. It says, They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and are very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev. The Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We can't attack these people. They're stronger than we are. And they, and, and they spread out among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, The land we explored devours those living in it. Those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak who came from Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. Uh oh, well, trouble in paradise. Moses has one call, and that's to lead these people into the promised land. I'm kind of curious why Moses would send out the spies. I guess he's just wanting to see what he's up against. So he sends out these 12 guys, and he's thinking they're going to come back, and they're going to tell us we can go, we can move forward, we can take the land. But 10 of these folks, 10 of these guys come back, and they report what we often find when it comes to taking risk and following God is that it's often a journey with obstacles. It's often a journey with obstacles, obstacles that we need to overcome. Here for the Israelites, they see a powerful people, heavily fortified cities. And when we think about others in the Bible, the challenges, the risks they took, and the challenges they had to overcome, you go to the disciples in the New Testament and Jesus saying, hey, come follow me. And the obstacle, the challenge of them leaving everything they'd known, leaving their families behind to follow this prophet, this teacher for three years to see if he knew what he was talking about, to risk their entire livelihood to follow Jesus. For Peter and Paul in Acts, we see that the risks that were before them were created obstacles or challenges of persecution and jail time, stoning, shipwrecks, and even martyrdom. For the Israelites, what happened in this moment as these 12 come back and these 10 say, oh my goodness, let me tell you, we can't do this. This obstacle became one overwhelming obstacle of fear. Fear. And fear is a very interesting emotion because it really is an emotion that has the ability to immobilize us. It is the emotion that can cause us to stop in our tracks and be paralyzed with an inability to move forward. And that's what happened here. You know, when I picked up that phone to call Carrie that evening, I had to overcome that fear. If not, I would have sat there and I would have thought, oh, I can't do this. Oh, I won't do it. Oh, I'm not going to do this. And it would have stopped me from pursuing that. And that's exactly what the Israelites faced here. You know, not only does fear immobilize us if we're not careful, but fear also causes us to have memory loss. And you think, well, that's crazy. What am I talking about? Think about the Israelites. Here they are. They've seen 10 incredible plagues. And this is just a year or so ago. They've seen 10 incredible plagues. They've seen God's presence descend on top of a mountain. They saw Moses come down. His face is shining. I mean, God is real. God is among them. They've got this pillar, uh, a cloud that leads them during the day and a pillar of fire that's leading them by night. These people have seen and experienced God in amazing ways over these last year. And in this moment, What stops them dead in their tracks is they completely forget who God is and what God is able to do. And that fear gives them 
that memory loss. And what we find is that when we struggle with fear, fear will either cause us to run towards God or to run away from God, to run towards what God is wanting us to do or to run away from where God is leading us. Now, I don't want to dismiss the fears of the people here. You know, sometimes I think we read the Bible and we get judgmental and we think, oh, I wouldn't feel that way. Oh, maybe you would. I mean, these, remember where these people had come from. They'd been slaves. They had been beaten and abused by the Egyptians. And they weren't a put-together nation of people. And yet they're facing these cities that have been established and been around with armies and with these incredibly massive walls, fortified cities. Of course they're going to be a little afraid. They're looking at what could happen. And of course what could happen is victory, sure, if God comes through. But on the other hand, we're looking at defeat. And that's on the plus side. On the really bad side, we're looking at death. They're going to kill us. They're going to kill us. Often, our obstacles that we face are not this dramatic, but the fear is no less powerful in causing us to stop moving forward. And maybe it's that fear of loss of control or a fear of new people or new experiences or that fear. And it is a fear of leaving our comfort zone. What the Israelites forgot completely was why they were there, what their point of existing right there in this moment was, which was to move forward into the promised land. And I think this is an interesting point that we, that we need to understand. Why that strip of land in that location at that time? Why would God care who lived right there? Because it was the crossroads of the civilization. A lot of trade ran through their harbor, uh, ports and everything. And God knew if he could put his people there, that the message that he was the one true God could then be spread from there. Their mission wasn't just to go destroy people and to live this high life in a land flowing with milk and honey. No, God's plan for them from the very beginning was to show the world that he was the one true God. That's why this land, that's why this moment is so significant. And while, they, while they're standing there at the gateway to the promised land, they're trembling in fear, seeing the obstacle, but forgetting why God would have brought them here in the first place. They forgot why they were there. They forgot God's promise to them. They forgot what God said he would do. And when faced with these big cities, and what seemed like big people, they refused to go in. Just because we follow Jesus doesn't mean we won't face obstacles. In fact, it's in facing these obstacles, these challenges, that we find what our faith is truly made of. It shows us where we're actually putting our trust. And it's when these moments that our faith is actually made stronger if we keep our eyes on Jesus. You see, personally, there are obstacles that can stop us in our tracks from wanting to move forward, but we can also face these challenges corporately, together, as the body of Jesus Christ, as the church. And sometimes we face obstacles and we have to ask ourselves, what's bigger, the obstacle we face or the God we serve? that typically will help us decide whether or not we're willing to take that risk. It's so another interesting aspect here is not just that when we move forward with God, when we take those risks, there will be obstacles. It's not going to be just, oh, let's take that step and it's easy. But the other interesting aspect here is that what happened when these spies came back is that we find that there's not just obstacles but objectors. In Numbers chapter 14, look at this. It says, That night all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If we, only we had died in Egypt or in the wilderness, why is the Lord bringing us here to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and our children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, why sh uh, We should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. 
You see, sometimes when we're faced with risk and we're faced with choices in following Jesus, yes, we'll see the obstacles, but we'll also have to understand that not everybody's going to be on board when it's time to move forward. And what's the saddest part of this story is that it only took 10 people to spread that and to turn the hearts of an entire nation towards not going forward with God. Moses, Aaron, Joshua, and Caleb fell down before the people and they pleaded with them. They reminded them that God was with them. But because of a few objectors, they chose to focus on the obstacles instead of God. The people threatened to stone the leaders and the decision was done. They decided in this moment they wouldn't move forward. They'd rather stay put than risk what God might have in store for them. You see, when God calls us to follow into new places, there will be people that object. They won't understand. They'll think it's foolish. They'll think it can't or shouldn't be done. They will see these obstacles as unnecessary hardships that we shouldn't have to face. And they'll do their best, do their best to convince others to stay with them. Now, I will say not all objectors are wrong, and this is where we as a body are called upon to have a spirit of discernment. Sometimes we have people that speak into our lives, and we need to understand where is, there, where is that voice coming from? Is it coming from a place of fear, a place of loss, or is it coming from God, insight? And this highlights that often I tell you, what the, what the Israelites, what they're struggling with here highlights for me is that sometimes when we think about the risks that we have to take, they're not external. The cha- greatest challenges we will face to these risks are often internal. What's happening within us. As I thought about us as a church and I think about the obstacles that we face, I understand that sometimes it's the objections inside that we have to overcome. Yes, I understand that the culture is getting harder to reach. It is. The world around us is no longer looking at the church as the center of community as it once did. I read a book recently where the guy started and he said, the church continues to try to answer questions that the world has stopped asking them years ago. And I thought, I'm going to like this book. It's eye-opening. Pastors used to be the pillars of community. The church was the center of life and everything rotated around it. But it's not that way anymore. And there's not one person in our community, there's not one neighbor that lives next door to us that is preventing us from experimenting with new ways of ministry or becoming the church that God wants us to be. The challenges are always going to be internal. And we can look at the community and we can look at the world and we can say, woe is me, woe is them. You know, if they really wanted Jesus, they'd come here and do things the way we do things. But can I ask you, how many of you do things the way your parents did? I don't. Why not? Because the world has changed. And the way I raise my children, there are overtones of my parents in there. But my parents did not have to deal with children that have to be limited on screen time every day. And a child who uses up your entire data plan on a church mission trip. I mean, they didn't have, not that that happened to us. But we're forced, we're forced to respond to the changes around us. And we can look at it and say, well, just get on board and do it this way. Or we can say, you know what? If the message stays the same, the method can change in any number of ways as long as it's effective in reaching the community. And how are we willing to do that? Where are the objections coming from? Are they externally? Probably not. Are they internal? Then why? Is it fear that's motivating it? Or is it insight and wisdom? I think we need to discern that. There's another thing that I find very interesting here in this passage, and I want you, I'm going to caveat this and say this is not meant to be offensive at all, but it's just something that jumped out at me as I read it. Look at verses three and four again. It says, why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword, our lives and our wives and children be taken as plunder? Look at this next question. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? We should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Egypt. 
You see, anytime we face risk, we see the obstacles, and that can play with us a little bit and create that fear. We can see the objectors and hear what they're saying to us, and that can kind of take us off track as well. But the other thing that we have to be careful of is idolizing the past. Idolizing the past. I find it incredibly fascinating that in these people who were slaves, and we're not talking a pleasant slavery here. Let's take that out. They were beaten. They were abused. They were, I mean, they were harsh taskmasters in Egypt. And when faced with taking, taking that step and going forward into the land, these people said, but think about how great it was back in Egypt. Man, it wasn't that bad. And I get it. Sometimes the good old days sit back there and we, isn't it amazing what memory can do? We can forget the hardship and the challenges and everything else. And we think, man, life was so perfect back then. No, it wasn't. I thought back to my first ministry, 22 years old, just graduated from college. I went to Northwest Arkansas to a church called Shepherd Fellowship. They hired me to be their part-time worship pastor, whopping $12,000 a year. Way to go. And I loved it. When I think back in ministry, I still think back very affectionately about that ministry, that period of time in my life. It was raw. It was fresh. It was new. And as I think about it, I mean, I got to lead worship. It was awesome. I got to lead small groups, which were great. I got to lead people to Christ, which was incredible. But if I'm not careful, I'll forget about the meetings that we had that were heart-wrenching, that were terrible. I'll forget about how these guys sometimes that said, hey, move your family here and we'll take care of you, didn't take care of us like they said. You see, I can, oh yeah, I remember the good old days, but man, we need to make sure that we're not idolizing the past. Would it be better for us to go back to Egypt? I don't think so. You see, sometimes we assume that the best way forward is to go backwards, but that's not the case. We have to trust that the God who has led us this far will continue to lead us forward, to understand that what lies before us it's not a better or worse than situation. We're not looking at the past going, well, now's better than then. That's not true. It's not a better or worse than. It just says that this is where God is now. God is not there. God is here and God is going forward. And so if we're going to keep moving, we've got to go where God is. Because if we want to know God better, if we want to experience God, it's not going to be discovered in the past. It's going to be discovered in relationship as we continue walking forward with him in the future. And the opportunity before us is always greater than what lies behind. We just can't get stuck living in the past. And fortunately for the Israelites, they made their decision. And it was not to move forward. They rebelled. They chose not to trust God into the unknown. And they said, we'll just stay put to hold on to what we see as less risky and more comfortable. And if you know the story, you know that that ended up costing them more than if they have just gone into the land. Deuteronomy chapter 1. Years ago, I was reading this Bible through in a year, and this, for some reason, this passage has just always stuck in my mind. Ryan's sick of me talking about it, so he's glad I'm preaching on it today, so I won't say it again for a few years. But in Deuteronomy chapter 1, it, came, it contains such an interesting verse about this entire story. Let me read this to you. It says, These are the words of Moses, spoke to all of Israel in the wilderness east of the Jordan, that is in the Arabah. Okay, so here's what's happened. They've been wandering for a while. Okay? Now, they're not back to Kadesh, but they are back at a gateway where they're about to face the choice again of whether or not to move forward. So it says they're east of the Jordan. It takes 11 days to go from Horeb to Kadesh Barnea by the Mount Seir Road. In the 40th year, on the first day of the 11th month, Moses proclaimed to the Israelites all the Lord had commanded him concerning them. Did you catch that? There are two critical numbers in that passage. They were at Mount Horeb. They were ready to go to Kadesh. That is an 11-day journey. And then Moses says, it says here, that in the 40th year, it took them 40 years to come back to this place. 40 years to take an 11-day journey. Their unwillingness to step out of their comfort zones and trust God 
to give up preferences and their ideas of what should be. Their desire to live in the past of the good old days and to give in to their fears caused an entire generation to miss out on experiencing God. One bad decision stalled their forward progress and moved them into reverse. For 40 years they wandered. But what I love about this passage is that in Deuteronomy chapter 1, The people stand here at the gateway again. They stand here with the choice again. Will we move forward or will we say no and walk away? I don't know that there's any better passage that illustrates this point. That sometimes not taking the risk is greater than the risk we actually face. We have to try to discern that. I'm not saying we act foolishly. I'm not saying we do things with reckless abandon. But I think we have to be willing to say, what is the greater risk? Change? Moving forward? Doing things differently? Or just trying to stay the way we are? You see, we're going to meet tonight in our annual meeting. And part of that is to discuss where we're going. I wish I could say, here's five things, five specific things we're going to do, but we just, we're kind of in this place where we realize some things have got to change. You know, when I say things have got to change, it's only strictly because I think staying put is riskier than not changing, not moving forward. Now, this message today does have a personal side to it as well. It's not just all about the church. You know, maybe you're at a crossroads in your own life. You're looking forward. You see obstacles. You've got fear, and you're not sure whether or not you should take that step. Maybe it's that step even to follow Jesus. I'll tell you today that taking, not taking the risk to follow Jesus is far greater than the risk of saying yes to him. It doesn't mean life gets easier. It doesn't mean everything is taken care of, but it does mean you have someone there with you every step of the way, the highs and the lows to see you through. You know, there may be other obstacles that you're facing, other challenges, other risks in your life that you're looking at. Maybe the risk is to reach out to your family or neighbors and tell them about Jesus. Maybe it's the risk of giving your marriage a second chance or the risk to reach out and seek reconciliation and forgiveness for someone. What if in that instance, the risk is actually greater to not do it than to do it? As I said, this is a message for us as a church because I think we have to ask ourselves, are we willing to move forward? And what does that look like? I'll tell you, I don't think the story of the Israelites is a perfect metaphor. There is no such thing as a perfect metaphor that applies. But I think there are some similarities that we have to see. The conversations about the future, the possible changes we need to make, how we navigate forward. I want you to know this isn't the first time we've been here as a church. A few months ago, uh, we were rummaging around in some boxes in the basement, and I came across this little gym right here. Does anybody recognize this? Lord, along your name's on it, or in it. This is a document from 1991. It is the Ashworth Road Baptist Church Long Range Plan. Remember that? Several of you were here when they did this. You guys did a lot of work. This was hard work. I shared this with our leadership team, too, because I said what I found fascinating was the similarities between where we were then, 18 years ago, and where we are now. Not 18 years ago, 28 years ago. Sorry, my math is bad. Is that right? 28. 28, thank you. That's why I have Ryan. He's my math in his head guy. 28 years ago. And as I said, what's fascinating is that I look through here. Yeah, some things have changed. Some names have changed. But everything else, the heart behind this document is the same. It's how do we become a church that reaches our community? How do we become a church that impacts where we live? That we do what we can to tell everybody we can about Jesus. That we do everything we can to love and share Christ in very visible and tangible ways through justice causes and to help our community. How do we continue to move forward as a church? And there were so many similarities between where we are then and where we are now. And I'll tell you, many of you that were here know that there was a dream in here. A dream to build another building and a dream to reach, what, 600 people by so many, whatever year, 2000. But we know that didn't come about. 
I'm going to just tell you, I don't blame anybody for that. There were a lot of things that happened over the last 28 years in this church. In that 28 years, this church made a very important decision that said we will support and affirm women in leadership. And I firmly believe that was a right move, but it was a tough move, wasn't it? Because it split the church. There were a few pastors along the way that came in and some had to be let go and some probably should have been let go much earlier than they were. And through just turmoil, the church struggled. I look back over the last seven years and I think, for the most part, we've had a church of prosperity, unity, growth, life change. People are being baptized every time we fill the tub. These are good things. But I do think we sit at the crossroads today where we're going to have to ask some tough questions. What if what we're doing isn't enough to continue to reach the community? This last slide I'll throw up is just my convictions about Ashworth Church. I'm still here because I believe God is still here, just so you know. I don't have any plans to go anywhere. You're stuck with me for until you run me off. But I am here because God is not done with us yet. If I didn't believe that, I'd have been out the door a long time ago. And I think many of you would have been too. What I also know is that what got us here will not be what keeps us moving forward. The culture has changed too dramatically. And we've got to figure out what it's going to take to reach them. read an interesting book that talked about Lewis and Clark and their expedition of the Louisiana Territory. They were looking for the Northwest Passageway. You guys know what that was? They were hoping to find a waterway from the Missouri River all the way to Pacific Ocean. For 300 years, nation after nation after nation had been looking for this mystical, unknown, undiscovered waterway. And do you know what Lewis and Clark found? It doesn't exist. They take their canoes off the, off the river and they come to these huge mountains, the Rockies. And you know what they had to do? In that moment, they had to decide, well, are we going to continue to look for a waterway that doesn't exist or are we going to learn how to canoe the mountains? And we know the story. They picked up people to help them. It was a long and difficult journey, but they learned not how to canoe. They learned how to scale those mountains and get over. That's the point we're at today. How are we going to scale these mountains? We will build on the sacrifices of those who were here before us. As I said, sometimes when we think about the past, it becomes an us versus them mentality. I know sometimes even in this, in this church, it's a first service versus second service mentality. That's gone. I hate that. And it's not a matter of what we did in the past being good, bad, or indifferent. It doesn't matter. I look back and I see a church that over the 48-year history of this church has had faithful dedicated men and women who have given of themselves in ways I don't even know. But the stories I've heard where there have been blood and sweat and tears and dollars and everything else so that we exist today, they did that. And as I sit here as your pastor, one of the challenges I face is I look and I say, how can I best honor the sacrifices of so many who have come before us here. Some of you, that's you in the room. You've been here that long. You know, you've given yourself completely. And you know that the worst thing that could possibly happen is for us to just bury our heads in the sand and act like the world has not changed and watch this place fall apart in 10 years. That doesn't honor anybody. What honors the legacy is figuring out how to make sure that there's another 48 years in the future where this church exists and is impacting this community. And the last thing up there just says this, Ashworth is worth fighting for. When I say that, I'm not talking about worship style. I'm not talking about color of carpet. I'm not talking about the way we do ministry. I'm saying this church was started in 1971 with a vision and a passion of reaching the West Des Moines community with the gospel of Jesus Christ and to be a light and a hope for the people around us. That is still worth fighting for today. We live in a world that as much as we say social, 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 it is the most disconnected community ever. 
And that is why it is our desire, our plan, our hope that we will always be Ashworth Church, a place to connect with one another, with Jesus, and with our community. To go forward, I'm just here to tell you there's going to be some risk involved. But I will also tell you I will never lead us presumptuously or anywhere I don't think God is going and I don't have the support and leading of a group of people behind us. It'll never be just Brent's vision. It'll be our vision to go into the unknown and discover what God has for us in the future. Would you pray with me?